Welcome to the All Reality Study Group. Our website, allreality.com, has a section on quantum physics research and on consciousness research. One of the conclusions of that research is that consciousness is primary. Consciousness, we're all consciousness, and consciousness is creating this reality and others. And if that's true, that means that consciousness can exist outside of the physical body. And that's what we see in reports of out of body travel. Unfortunately, a lot of those reports sound like they could be hallucinations in the case of near-death experiences or dreams in the case of people who have had out-of-body experiences connected with sleep, waking up, going to sleep, and so on. However, some of the reports have evidential corroborative aspects to it. People are out of their body and then see and hear something that they have no way of knowing about unless they're actually out of their body. And then when they come back, they're able to corroborate that what they saw or heard actually happened. And those types of reports are very important because they corroborate the conclusions of the research that we're seeing on our website. And as a result, we've decided to make a database online of video reports, first-hand reports of people who have had out-of-body experiences that have a corroborative evidential aspect to it. So that's a project that we're about to launch. Uh, anybody who has an experience like that, that wants to videotape themselves talking about it, uploading it to v YouTube, We'll put it on the website. You can contact us through allreality.com and we'll explain how to do all that. Or if you're a member of the study group, at the end of each meeting, our monthly meetings, we'll be happy to video you if you want to do a report and have us take care of the video part. And if you haven't had a first-hand experience, then... Um, but you've read an account that has a corroborative evidential aspect to it in one of the many books about out-of-body travel that you think is a, a very interesting account, you're welcome to make a video report about that account. And we'll put that up as well. So that's our new project. And in honor of the new project, the subject of this month's meeting is out-of-body travel. And we're going to hear about that from a representative of an organization that has offices all over the world where they teach people to do out-of-body travel. So please help me welcome from the Los Angeles chapter of the International Academy of Consciousness, Louis Minero. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. <clears throat> like uh, David was saying, you know, uh, I'm part of the ISE, the International Academy of Consciousness, and we do. We give classes all over the world, and our main intention is precisely to try to help people with information on the out of party experiences and, you know, to help them to develop their own skills. Yeah? But just um, give me just a second here. I, had, I didn't have this quite ready because I want to give you a little bit more of information of who we are. There we go. Okay. So uh, just, you know, a minute or two so that you know a little bit more about, you know, where this information comes from and where this research comes from. The, the IAC is a pretty large international organization, a non-profit organization that is dedicated precisely to the study of this subject, the out-of-party experience especially, but also paranormal phenomena, viral energies, uh, consciousness evolution, spiritual development, etc., etc., etc. We give classes all over the world. You can probably see this down here, or actually maybe not. Sometimes I joke with this that if you're able to read the names of the cities here, you probably already have some clairvoyance. 
I don't know who picks the colors at the home office, but it, you know, even looking at it in the computer, I'm unable to read them. So, uh, but you know, basically what it says here, just because I know it from memory, Australia, Sydney, it was who falls in Brazil, Frankfurt in Germany, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Milan, Mexico City, in Portugal, in these three cities, <laughs> Barcelona and Madrid in Spain, London, the United Kingdom, and here in the US, Los Angeles, Miami, and New York. So these are the places where we have uh, permanent offices and we offer classes pretty regularly, pretty much every, every weekend. Aside from that, us as instructors, as researchers, we go to other cities to offer this on a more temporary basis. And this is the case of the San Francisco Bay Area, of Phoenix sometimes, in the east coast of Philadelphia, of Boston, of Gainesville, in other corners of the world. In Europe is the case of Finland, of Switzerland, of Cyprus. In Asia is the case of Hong Kong, of Tokyo, actually. So uh, just this more than anything, just to give you an idea of the size of the institution. I would say in the entire world we must be about between all my colleagues, between three to 500 researchers more dedicated to the, to the study of all of these topics. Most of my colleagues, they are doctors. They are psychologists. This is certainly the, the groups that represent you know, the majority. But there are all kinds of scientists, you know, uh, physicists, chemists, biologists, sociologists, et cetera, et cetera. And also beyond that, there is a certain percentage of my colleagues, maybe a smaller percentage, that doesn't necessarily have a college degree. But they have a lot of experience with all of this phenomena, and they contribute with all of this. And this, of course, is more than welcome as well. Yeah? So this, more than anything, just to give you an idea of the institution. Our headquarters, they are actually based in Portugal, where we have sort of like a university campus. And uh, this is like the architectural layout of the, of the land. This is not all, I guess. Actually, the land continues quite a bit down here and quite a bit down here. but. Aside from administrative buildings that not all of it is fully built, maybe the most interesting thing for participants at the beginning are these you know, uh, little white balls that you see here, that they are individual laboratories for producing different paranormal phenomena. David here was talking about evidential uh, you know, uh, experiences, right? So what happens is in these individual laboratories, people go in, they produce a specific energetic phenomena or an out-of-party experience. This actually happens here in this main lab in the middle that is called the projectarium. I don't know if you are able to, to see the right in there. But the projectarium would be the specialized lab for producing projections outside the body or out-of-party experience, astral travel, unfolding, mystic voyage. I don't know what might be the name that is more common you know, uh, to you for this phenomenon. To give you an idea of how it looks, I think I have a picture of this. Yeah, it's actually a complete sphere. It continues underneath the ground. It is uh, you know, um, empty inside. There is a plank in the middle. There is a bed also, a very comfortable bed in the middle, and people lie down there, and there are several architectonic optimizations, but especially energetic optimizations that facilitate, that help so that people have out-of-party experiences. Thousands of experiments already were done in this, you know, laboratory. And after that, you know, us as researchers as well, not only have we, have I tried the projectarium, but also as, a, as researchers, we're trying to understand everything about the phenomenon. All the variables, for example, is it easier to leave the body for older people or for younger people? Is it easier to leave the body for men or for women? Is it easier to leave the body if the person took a vitamin, a supplement, a specific medication, or, or does that hinder? You know, just trying to understand basically all the possible variables. Which technique did people use? Which one seemed to be more effective? And part of that information is what we use, you know, all over the world in our classes, in our presentations, you know, um, in, in, in any language, basically. So uh, this, more than anything, I put it here at the beginning just for you to get an idea of one research line so that you get the, also the, the idea that the information is not static, but is something that keeps on progressing and evolving the way science, of course, does. Yeah? So this to give you that idea there. Now, something very important for us, we always like to start out you know, with, this, uh, with this phrase that in this case is over there in the middle of the you know, tape to the table. 
and basically says, don't believe in anything, not even in what we are saying here, but experiment, have your own experiences. And we say this really for a lot of reasons. First of all, because of, you know, we realize that for a lot of people, you know, the out-of-party experiences still fall into the category of belief. You know, could it be? Could it not be? So obviously we don't want to sound as if we are have the or, or as if we are the owners of the truth and we are just simply telling you how things are. But our intention is really more than anything to inform people and hopefully the information is going to contribute somehow, you know, to their own development. Yeah. The other thing also and the other reason why we have this phrase is because our intention, especially with our classes, with our books, is to try to give as much information so that the person develops its own experiences without any type of of, you know, attachment to us or indoctrination, if you understand what I mean, or, you know, having to come back, I don't know, every Thursday night or every Sunday for some sort of a session or tweaking, there really is no, no need for that. So uh, certainly, you know, uh, we hold ourselves to this, by all means, keep this, this idea in mind. And the other thing, of course, is because, you know, the best way to corroborate, to verify that all of these realities are so, is precisely by having the person its own experiences. Certain things about the out-of-body experiences, sometimes they can be measured physically. And some evidence can be given, of course. But I would say, I would venture, I don't know if all of you would be in agreement with me with this, that the most interesting out-of-body experiences that go even beyond the physical reality, unfortunately at this moment we don't have machines that can measure that. There is no way to give a physical proof of something that goes way beyond the physical reality. So the best way for the person to corroborate and to verify you know, that these realities are so is precisely the person developing its own experiences, going and observing that directly. Yeah? Now, however, still within the realm of, of science and evidence, you know, we do try as much as we can you know, as time permits, on produce conventional data. So just to give you here a couple of uh, ideas about, about research, you know. The first thing is, let me begin actually first of all with this one, the projective field uh, that I see from the website and from the, you know, um, the introduction, that I think it's something that is going to contribute here. We have this course, we could say, because it's actually open to anybody, you know, in, in any corner of the world. And when we give it, it's about 60, 70 people lying down in a ballroom of a hotel, and they have to try to leave their body, go to another room where that is completely empty and locked, and there is only there a computer that has a database of images. It's going, the computer is going to pick one of these images, and it's going to display this image, you know, into this room that is locked and empty. And of course, the people that are in the ballroom, they have to leave the body, they have to go to this room, try to see the image, then they go back. When they wake up, they actually fill out a, rep a, re a report. And before the room is open, you know, there is an auditor, somebody that is not associated with the IAC, usually somebody like a college professor or a journalist, that actually spends the entire time outside the room, you know, just making sure that nobody physically went in. You know, nobody went in and actually he has, you know, the key. So when all of the forms of all of the reports of the people, you know, are brought to him, he signs to attest that, you know, he saw them all before opening the door, then the door is open, and then you go and you see, you know, the image. So this is what in science is called a double-blind experiment, because nobody knows what the image is, not even the researchers, yeah? Now, we have already had success with that. Actually, just, uh, what was it, a couple of months ago, we had this uh, course in uh, this activity in Portugal. Because I, I am one of the people of the staff, I don't get to practice or to participate, you know, on all of the attempts. But on the one or two attempts that I participated, I saw the image, and the image was exactly the one, you know, that was displayed there. So that's just, you know, one success that I had. But a lot of other people already have had this. And this is, again, you know, science, conventional science. Of course, if you ask us, you know, that piece of information versus an out-of-party experience where we can find out information, let's say, about what is our life purpose, what is more interesting, I would pick the second one. But still, we do the effort, you know, of trying to provide conventional data, yeah? The second, I guess, thing that, I, that I'm going to talk about here, just in terms of conventional research, is that we've started doing uh, research with functional MRIs. 
I don't know how familiarized you are with this. Maybe, hopefully, you have never had had to undergo an MRI, because then it means probably there was something wrong with us, right? But there, is a, there are the normal MRIs, you know, the medical resonance imaging, magnetic resonance imaging, and then there's the functional MRI. And the idea is in the functional MRI that they show the functioning of the physical body, you know, to be able to see if this equipment is able to perceive the energies, the energy system that is responsible for helping us to have out-of-body experiences. And then we already did also, you know, hundreds of experiments in functional MRIs, and you realize that there is, uh, the machine is perceiving this substance, you know, outside the head of the person. Something that, you know, the, the technician, you know, the doctor actually that was there, you know, helping us even had this reaction to the, to, to, for the first time, him seeing something outside, some functioning outside the physical body, which is, of course, physically, is completely impossible. His reaction was, look, you guys broke my, my machine. You know, this is just impossible. Now you're going to need a theoretical physicist to explain this. This is beyond the realm of medicine. So, and this is an article actually that is going to be published, hopefully by the end of the year, in, in conjunction with um, IONS, with Dean Radin. Probably some of you might have already read, you know, some things about him. He's also another researcher that sometimes we are in collaboration with. Yeah? So, this more than anything here to give you a little bit of idea of the, of some of the efforts to provide conventional information. Now, of course, you know, uh, as I was saying, we leave the body, and the moment that you are outside the body, you are not necessarily concerned with, uh, with you know, with the verification, not, not necessarily. The moment that you are outside the body and you are aware, conscious, lucid, and you can think as clearly as you are right now, you try to use the out-of-body experience for, you know, for personal gain, for the benefit of yourself, for understanding, you know, other things. And this is really where the second study, I guess, let me see if I have this here. Well, that image will do, I guess. This is where the second study comes in. We basically focus on two main subjects. The first one is this small little pocketbook, as we joke, you know, the textbook of projectology, so the projections outside the body. How do you do it? What are the techniques? When you go out, what do you see? What are the dimensions? What are the characteristics of the so-called astral body? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, you know, one, not the easiest book to read. It's pretty technical and, you know, but still available, no doubt. And the second one is, got to be a little go to the gym to, you know, lift these books here. The second one, unfortunately, is still just in Portuguese, but I know that the word in Portuguese is not a different from our English, is conscientiology. Believe it or not, that is English. <laughs> conscientiology is the, the, the subject that studies the consciousness. So the moment that you have out of party experiences, just to, you know, try to explain to you how one thing relates to the other, the moment that you have out of body experiences and you want to try to use them you know for your benefit for the development of yourself this is where the topic of conscientiology comes in we all have a physical body we all have been observing the physical reality in the physical dimension for many many years and because of this we understand well the physical reality we understand about life about economy about geographical divisions about our fico score that we are fighting to keep it up right so this is all the physical reality. Great, excellent. Yes, I don't know if there's anything more mundane and physical than our FICO score, but still we worry about it. Of course, transportation issues, insurance, etc. Great. Now we start having out-of-party experiences, and then we start being able to observe, for example, us outside the body and other individuals who are outside the body and other indiv individuals that at this moment they don't have a physical body to come back to. And of course, with that direct observation, you start to wonder, what is it that they do if they don't have to worry about transportation issues, about eating, you know, sleeping, and all of the things that we have to worry about? So using the out-of-party experience, you are able to observe individuals, you know, entities in the wild, so to speak. Do you understand what I mean? One thing is to, to observe and to study the hippos or the animals, you know, in the zoo, 
Another thing is to study them, you know, in the wild. So all of us, maybe, I don't know if all of you would agree this, but, you know, what we see from the evidence of -of out-of-body experiences and a lot of different paranormal phenomena, and probably most of you, you you agree with this, you perceive this, you have the intuition of this, is that we are much more than the physical body. This is just a temporary condition. So the moment that you leave the body, you, you see this reality. You are faced with this reality. But at the same time, you are able to explore it. What is it that those individuals do when they are outside the body? And of course, we start to wonder, what is it that I did before I had a physical body? What is it that my soul, my spirit, my essence did before I had a physical body? What is it that I am going to do once my physical body passes away? Once my entire, how could I say, sense of identity that I have from this physical life is no longer. Because notice how it's interesting that this physical life, of course, conditions us so much that we really think that we are this. We really think that we are only, let me put it this way, only our education, only a product of our family of our culture, and the moment that we have out of party experiences and we realize, look, I am a soul or a consciousness or an entity or a being that goes beyond form, space, time, you know, but at this moment I am restricted by form, time, and space and living a specific role, you know, this opens our eyes quite a bit. So, just to come down a little bit from the abstract ideas, you know, into something maybe more specific and practical. I don't know what is the extent of your out-of-body experiences. Maybe some of you here already had quite a bit. Maybe some of you are interested in this topic. Maybe some of you are scared <laughs> you know, by the topic. That's okay, you know. Still welcome, no, no problem with this. But I don't know how many of you maybe have undergone a situation like this, where you leave your body and you are outside your body looking at your physical body in bed, sleeping. If you haven't had this condition happen to you, I don't know if at this moment you can imagine what your reaction will be the first time that you are in this situation. This is interesting. This changes a little bit the perspectives, you know, of what we consider, you know, reality to be or priority to be. Maybe the FICO score, even though it's still important, you know, is no longer as important as other things, yeah? But the moment that we are here looking at our physical body lying in bed, also a lot of other ideas where the, you know, understanding of the consciousness come in, you know, can pop up in our mind. Like, for example, first of all, the idea of identity, like I was saying. We can be looking there at our physical body. Let me put my example. I had OBE since I was 12. Um, At first, I didn't know, you know, if there was a name, if there were techniques, if people did them or not, etc. If everybody did them, I just had them, really. And I have, I have done this, you know, several times of seeing my physical body lying in bed. And I see there my physical body and I realize this physical body has a name. Mine just happens to be Luis Minero, and all of you have your own specific one. And I realize this reality, Luis Minero, with all of his network of relationships, sisters, uh, mother, father, bank accounts, passport, all of this certainly is part of me. However, I realize in this very simple experience that I am here outside Luis Minero, aware, conscious, being able to learn things that my brain doesn't know at this moment. It will only know the moment that I go back, and if I transfer the information to the brain, if I share it with the brain, let's put it this way. So the question is, if I am not what I have been used to all my life, if I am not only Luis Minero, then who am I? What am I? Because really, Luis Minero was always, is a part of me, but always just a fraction of what I am. And then I realized that the out of party experience can help me to gather information and to understand a larger reality about myself and help me to understand this question, who am I as a soul, as a consciousness, as as an entity, as a spirit, whichever name we might want to give it, yeah? Another thing, I am there looking at my physical body, and like I was hinting just a few moments ago, I can start thinking about the past. I realize this, you know, um, substance, this entity, I'm, I'm going to call it entity, or, you know, this soul, this spirit, you know, existed before the physical body was born. So then the question would be, and the more specific, the better, two years before I was born, where was I? Because I didn't have the physical tool to be able to interact with the physical reality. 
So I was somewhere in these astral planes, as people like to call them, or dimensions, or parallel worlds, or alternative planes of existences. I don't know also us humans how many names we have given right to these uh, other realities. So I was there, but where specifically? And I realized that in an out-of-body experience, I can go, you know, investigate a little bit and find, you know, information that is going to help me to answer now another very old question of the philosophy. Where do I come from? Usually when somebody asks us where do we come from, we give them a, a physical reference. And this is probably what they want, of course. You know, I usually say Florida. But if I were to say, you know, I come from dimension X, I think that they wouldn't talk to me ever again. But... This is not so much so as to tell other people, but it's more than anything for us to understand, you know, ourselves better. And the same thing works towards the future. By the way, whenever this physical body deactivates, hopefully still in many, many decades from now, for all of us, you know, we are going to be back in these realities. But I realized that in an out-of-body experience, I can go beforehand and have an understanding of where I am going to be. And then come back and continue living my life without necessarily any trauma or any hesitation, or, you know, because of this uh, moment, because of the transition of death, let's put it this way. So in this very simple, you know, relatively simple experience, I realized I survived physical death. And another thing, maybe even more, more practical, let's put it this way. I am there looking at my physical body, and then I realize I am not the physical body. However, every day of my life, I am inside this physical body, wearing it and using it. And, you know, it takes me around the entire human existence. And then the question is, why? If I am not a physical body, why do I have one? Could it be that there is a reason or a cause or an, or an objective or, you know, Sometimes people like to call this more popularly of a, of a life purpose, a life mission. Could it be that there is such a thing? What I can tell you is when we have out-of-party experiences, you know, we find that there is a range of realities or dimensions where people intelligently, before being born, they are planning their main tasks in this life or their main uh, objectives, their main lessons in the case of some of them. And of course, we can go outside the body, have an understanding, gather information about what was my initial intention for deciding to come into this physical life in the first place. Yeah? But all of this, by the way, not because somebody is going to tell you what is, you know, somebody is going to tell you the story, but all of this because now you have the ability, you know, to do it. Of course, where is it? Here, right? <laughs> So um, that, that is the objective. But I was giving this example more than anything to try to understand better conscientiology. So the process of, you know, um, the study of the soul, the study of the consciousness, the study of the essence through the out of body experiences. Yeah? And by the way, also maybe an interesting consideration to make here. Notice how all of these ideas that I was just mentioning, that they go very much to the heart of what we consider reality to be or, you know, um, yeah, what we consider reality to be, all of them, they can come to us in what we were calling at the beginning a very simple out-of-body experience, meaning we haven't left the bedroom yet. So the consideration here would be what is the potential for growing, for developing, for understanding on our, you know, by, by ourselves the moment that we start having out-of-body experiences outside the bedroom. How much more can we observe and understand? The, you know, the answer is it's almost unmeasurable, of course. But anyways, this is conscientiology, to give you that, uh, that perspective there. Now, there are, of course, a lot of different types of out-of-body experiences and a lot of different types of names. I would say probably the most common one besides, you know, the different types of names coming here to the bottom, you know, the most common one is the first one, the spontaneous one. And probably several of you might have already had, you know, some of these. Um, the spontaneous experience is that one where on a particular night, for no apparent reason, the person wakes up and wakes up, you know, floating sometimes close to the ceiling or close to the wall. In essence, it's, you know, floating close to the physical body where 
where you know we realize that we spend most of the nights of our life meaning what I'm trying to say is when we go to bed at night and we fall asleep, our astral body or you know emotional body or psychosoma already disconnects from the physical body and we basically spend the entire night, let me see if I have this image here, uh, we basically spend the entire night in this condition, you know, um, floating just a few inches you know, above the physical body. Interesting that in your experience, that she was telling me before her first experience, you found yourself in this condition. But, you know, uh, trying to be maybe a little bit more definitive with this, everybody leaves the body every night. This is, you know, what is observed, what is, you know, the evidence. If you go and you read accounts from people from different centuries, from different cultures, from different eras, some of those cultures don't even exist anymore, they would describe this. I left my body, I saw my, my husband, my daughter, my mother, whomever might be sleeping close by, and I found them in this situation. So by the same token, if you leave your body tonight, I don't know who might sleep close to you, don't be surprised, you know, to find them in this condition. Yeah? What is interesting about this condition is that this shows us, first of all, since it's already happening every night, that leaving the body must not be that hard. Think about it. It happens involuntarily, spontaneous, every night, more or less like breathing, that we don't have to apply our conscious will in order for it to work. Yeah? By the same token, returning and coming back into the body must not be that hard. Because every morning of our life, we come into the physical body and we inhabit the, the gorilla here, you know, the, the ape that we have been given to go through the human existence again, the biological robot, so to speak. By the same token, you know, spending time outside the body, by the way, must not be dangerous. Let's think about this a little bit more. Think about how much time we have spent outside the body already. I'm not trying to say aware, conscious, being able to take advantage of it, but just simply floating above the body. So we sleep an average of eight hours a day. I know that when we were babies, we used to sleep 14, 16, and with age, this starts to diminish quite a bit. But the average is about eight hours in 24. So that's a third of the day, that's a third of the week, that's a third of life. So if we are 30, we have slept 10 years. If we are 45, we have slept 15. If we are 60, we have slept 20. My grandfather passed away with 96, so he slept 32 years of his life. This is, a lot. This is an entire life, especially when we consider that it's made up of 24 hours. So during this entire time, we were floating above the body. Unaware, most of the times, even the ones that have out-of-party experiences don't, normally don't spend most of their time aware. So unaware, unconscious, without realizing it, but outside. Yeah? So of course, this is time that we could use better, let's put it this way. But beyond that, we could also go back to the original question, how dangerous was that time? Probably, I, I think that you're going to agree with me that the moment or the time that we spend lying in bed sleeping is probably the safest time, you know, during the course of our day. Just driving in a city as crazy as this one to come to this lecture, we were a lot more at risk, you know, than years and years and years of sleeping. Yeah? So the question is if. Leaving the body is relatively easy, coming back is relatively easy, and spending time is basically safe. What is it that we want to learn? What we want to learn more than anything is to develop the awareness, the consciousness outside the body. And this is something, how am I going to say, that has many facets, but one of the reasons why sometimes this is not more common, you know, in society, really is no fault of ours. It has more than anything to do with classic Western education. We haven't been raised to value what happens during the night. But on the contrary, we have been raised to dismiss it to a certain extent. Let me see if I can give you a, a different perspective of this. I have read of a few, you know, cultures in, in Australia, one or two in Africa, that when they wake up, the parents, you know, when they are gathered in the morning to have the first meal of the morning, you know, the parents are asking the kids, you know, what did you do last night? Where did you go? You know, how aware were you? And then, of course, they have certain rituals and techniques that they give the kids, you know, so that the following night, hopefully they're going to apply them. But even if they don't, they know that they're going to be quizzed the following morning. 
And the next night, you know, they should apply them, and the following morning, using our Western lingo, the behavior is positively reinforced. The next night, they try to stay more aware, more reinforcement, awareness, reinforcement, and they grow up in a completely different condition than us, or let me at least put it in this fashion, than me. I wish I would have had, you know, this type of, a, of an education with regards to out-of-party experiences. Yeah, of course, our culture has a lot of other advantages. I'm not denying those, not at all. Um, but because of this, you know, what happens is, and because of the identification with the physical body, which is part of our classic Western education, when we go to bed, we have the tendency to want to sleep, to shut down, you know, to go offline, so to speak. I don't know if you would even agree with me that in this big city life, you know, when we lie down in bed, if 20 minutes already went by and we haven't fallen asleep, we are already worried. We are already thinking, I have to fall asleep because we know what's coming tomorrow. Yeah? So there is already this tendency. Let me see if I can give you a different example. When you leave the body, you can go outside the body, and you know your hand can go through anything that is physical, of course. But something that maybe some of you might have already experimented, or, or maybe not, is that you can go through anything that is physical, but you will not go across yourself. Because it's almost as if you are the same density, and you won't necessarily go across somebody else. If two people leave the body, you can hug them, you can shake hands, you know, and you're going to feel that there is substance there. Yeah. So I have a friend of mine that has done a lot more research on this. I have done this a few times. But um, this friend of mine has done a lot more research on this. He, you know, left his body. His older brother was sleeping in this condition, disconnected from his physical body. And he tried for many months and years to wake him up outside the body. Yeah? Now, so he would go and try to grab like the shoulders of the astral body of the brother to try to wake them up and everything. And you know, when you try this really 99% of the cases, nothing happens. The person doesn't even move. But on 1% of the cases that he was mentioning, you know, sometimes his brother would open his eyes, he would look at him and he would say, ah, it's you, let me sleep. Then immediately he would go back to sleep and then he wouldn't wake up at all again, which shows the intention of the person, yeah? Why am I saying this? Because uh, this hopefully can help in this regard. Sometimes disconnecting the body is not the hardest thing, or not the most, uh, yeah, the most difficult thing. The most important thing is being able to keep the awareness. And this has to do with an internal ability of ours to necessarily disconnect Sometimes somebody else might produce it on you, or a machine might produce it on you, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to keep it. So you can ride a bicycle with training wheels, and you can go very far. But the moment that the training wheels are removed, you still have to learn equilibrium. So one thing is being in a state, and another thing is being able to hold it and keep it. This, I think it's important, you know, to associate ideas there with that. Yeah? But let me, let me go a little bit further here, that there are still a couple of things here that I think are, are important. Even I want to give you some, some techniques on how to do this and even practice them, of course. But look, besides the spontaneous experience that is the most common, then there is the forced OBE. I'm sure that you have already read about this one. The main thing that fits in here is the near-death experience. You know, when people clinically die for a few minutes because of a number of reasons, really, a heart attack, A, B, C, D, and then they're brought back to life. Yeah? Now, in the, the, maybe mo the most interesting thing about the near-death experience is, again, the change that people undergo once they, have, once they come back from the near-death experience. And I'm sure that you probably have seen this, right? They themselves, they say, look, I have completely different priorities. I am a much better person. Not to say that they were a bad person before. No, more than likely they weren't. It's just that now they realize that they are much, much better. And there is a, a list of things you know, that they usually manifest or present more. For example, they lose the fear of death, which is a, you know, unfortunately still very prevalent you know, in, in society, of course. But even with regards to losing the fear of death, hmm, let me talk a little bit about death and the fear of death. It's for the following. I don't know if in society there is a place where we can talk about death and the fear of death, you know, openly. 
Usually nobody wants to talk about this. I sometimes joke that when we gather, you know, if we were to gather with our family, I don't know, around Thanksgiving and the turkey is there in the middle and we tell them, hey guys, how about if we talk about death for a half an hour here, huh? Just to get a better understanding. I don't think anybody's going to touch the turkey after that. <laughs> you know, it's going to be this silence, and usually there isn't a lot to say. Because what happens is that the reason why there is such a, um, you know, a prevalent fear is because it's a very big unknown. This is really the main thing. But in the case of the individuals that went through the near-death experience, they now have an experience with that, and it's not such an unknown. They know much better, I will continue, or I can exist beyond my physical body, you know, um, after I pass away. But they know this not in the theory. In the theory, most people know it. In the practice is the thing. Because, see if you can uh, appreciate here the difference. Most people in the world, I would say, believe, accept, have an understanding that they will continue existing after they pass away. No doubt. But these same people who believe very strongly are afraid of death. So it's not the theory that matters. It's the practice. You know, it's the fact that the person already lived that. And then the individuals that undergo the near-death experience, they already, of course, observe that. They already live that. They, they relax with that in the practice and not just in the theory. Understanding concepts is something that we do very, very quickly. Where the development is, is in the repetition, of course, in the practice, in the training, so to speak. Yeah? Now, what ends up happening is, and there is a line of psychology that explains this better, sometimes from the basic fear of death and of dying, we have small phobias, little fears, some insecurities, sometimes not so little, that originate from this basic fear. And when the person loses the fear of death, all of these other things also have no reason for existing, and they also disappear. And the end result for this individual is that they become a lot more open, spontaneous, you know, grounded, stable, uh, effective, more morally courageous, more authentic. And these are things that are very hard to measure, even in, a, how could I say, in a scientific sense. Do you, do you understand what I mean? How do we measure authenticity in somebody? It's not that simple, right? However, the person realizes I am a lot more effective in my life and in everything that I do from this moment onwards. And that has a very real effect on the person. Yeah? So notice how losing the fear of death sounds easy to say, but it actually has a lot of other ramifications and consequences and benefits, I should say. Yeah? Another thing is, you know, they usually become more humane. They try to help other people more. They try to volunteer more wherever they, they can, right? Uh, another thing is most of them, they come back with more energy for their physical life. They want to live. They want to accomplish things. They want to do things. And to a certain extent, it's because during the near-death experience, they get a glimpse, you know, of what is their life task and their life purpose. And, of course, they come back, you know, with a greater sense of direction to try to, you know, implement that. And that also is to their benefit. Naturally, yeah? Now, also more or less doing the same consideration. If all of these, how could I say, benefits, you know, positive consequences come to the person with this one experience, only one, sometimes traumatic, sometimes not ideal, and not desired, the near-death experience, we could also consider here, you know, what would be the results of 10 years of out-of-party experiences. For us, for our own understanding, for our own development. Again, you know, the, the results, the benefits are basically unmeasurable. Yeah? Now, I promise neither in our books, nor in our classes, nor here, <laughs> are we going to try any forced out-of-party experiences. They're all going to be the third kind, okay? The provoked that will. Now, this one here, by the way, is the least common of the three. This is something that, of course, we're trying to change, and we see that a lot of people are also there, you know, working towards that effort. Now, even trying to explain a little bit the mechanism of the, of the OBE so that we can get here even to, to a technique here. Let me, this room is so big. Now, you can see here in this image all of these connections between the two bodies, all of these energy connections. These energy connections basically hold, you know, or are 
are a very big key towards the learning the control of the disconnection, you know, uh, in terms of having out-of-body experiences. If those energies are a little bit more, more rigid, more unflexible, more out of shape, then it is harder for the person to disconnect from its body. But if those energies are a little bit more flexible, more in good shape, you know, more free-flowing, so to speak, then it becomes easier for the person to disconnect. Yeah. Now we know that even though a lot of people have out of party experiences, the majority of the society doesn't. So it means that most people, in most of their nights, they have their energies a little bit more rigid, more stuck. And the question would be why? Because the answer is precisely what helps us, you know, to start to, to control this. The answer is not really not uh, different from the one that I was giving before. It has to do with classic Western education. It's unfortunately something that is not taught, you know, on, to people. And think about it. How many co-workers do you have, you know, from work? How many relatives do we have, do we know, that they exercise their energetic system? Maybe we know some, right? But we realize that it's a very small minority. And it's no fault of theirs. It's just simply lack of information, unfortunately. But if we can learn to, you know, put this energy system in good shape, it's going to allow the disconnection, and it's going to be easier for us to disconnect, uh, which is, by the way, or it would be doing what the system was designed to do. So this is not uh, unlike when, for example, we spend four or five weeks in a cast, and when they remove the cast, we are not able to move you know, the wrist because of lack of use, really. But after a few days, weeks of you know, some exercises, maybe months, we recover the normal functionality of the member. So the same thing here. It's just a matter, basically, of starting to you know, develop this energetic control so as to you know, for it to allow the disconnection, you know, that, um, that produces the, the out-of-body experience. Now, one of the better exercises that I can give you here for producing the OBE, and let me see if I have this here, there are actually a lot of different types of techniques. Look, this is from, from my book, by the way, the, the now oh, I even forgot the name of the book. <laughs> the Mystifying the Out-of-Body Experience, as if I had that many, right? But anyway, <laughs> The Mystifying the Out-of-Body Experience. So there is a chapter there, you know, that is, you know, how to, how to do it. And there are there maybe like 12, 14 techniques, you know, on how to do it on different types of attributes, of course. You know, uh, relaxation, imagination, creativity, concentration, breathing, uh, energy work, uh, mental saturation, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, so there are, really there are, that I know of maybe, maybe close to a hundred techniques, even because this big blue book that I was one of the ones that helped to translate it to English must have maybe about 50 or so. So that I know of about a hundred. But the one I want to talk to you about is this one. Because I think it's maybe one of the more basic ones. It's one of the ones that is going to help to loosen up your energy condition. It's also going to help you to keep your awareness under control and stable once you are outside the body. Yeah, so it really has a lot of advantages and benefits. We call it VILO. So don't worry too much about the long technical name, but in essence what we do is, or what you would do, is when you're at home, you want to be in a non-disturbed place, and almost as if you were going to do a meditation, you know, close the door, try to diminish the stimulus so that there isn't like the bright lights, you know, in your eyes to a certain extent. But uh, what you're going to do is try to sit comfortably or standing or lying. We're going to start to move our energy from inside our body, from our head running downwards towards our feet, from our feet towards our head, towards our feet, towards our head, towards our feet. And as we start to control this better and better and better, we're going to start to accelerate this, you know, and increase the speed of this, and we try to reach a resonance condition that is called of the vibrational state. Probably, if you have already read about out-of-body experiences, you have seen that a lot of people describe these strange vibrations in their mind just before having an out-of-body experience. So this exercise here induces the vibrations that in turn induce the out-of-body experience. Yeah? The theory, in essence, is not that difficult. And 
Usually the theor theory is not. You know, the, the key of this is in the repetition, in the practice. Yeah? How long does it take, you know, to explain to somebody how to drive? One minute, 30 seconds maybe. But how long does it actually take them to learn how to drive? A couple of weeks, after a month, they're still running over the curb, right? Over the neighbor's flowers and different things. So really the key is in the repetition. Like anything in life, you know, the fifth time that we're doing something, we're better than the first time. And the 100th time that we're doing something, we're better than the fifth time, naturally. So we're going to practice this in a, in a moment. For sure, we're, I want to, you know, dedicate some time here to do the, to do the exercise there. Okay. Um, let me just see if I, yeah, just finishing here with a couple of things. Uh, once we start having out-of-body experiences, of course, we can have all kinds of experiences. You know, the astral body can go through physical things, of course. Um, different, there are a lot of different characteristics outside the body compared to the physical reality. You know, time and space start to blend a little bit. We can reach, you know, far away places in a very short time, and sometimes we don't even need to reach them. For example, just like I was explaining, and like you can see here that your hand can go through anything that is physical, your senses can go through anything that is physical as well. So let's say that I was outside my body here, you know, projected. And let's say all of a sudden I start that looking for my wallet and you know I don't have it I can certainly go with my astral body to my house to look for it maybe I left it on top of the desk but I don't have to I can just simply displace my sight and put my sight in my house even though my astral body is still here and I can see on top of the desk I can see inside the drawer I can see inside the other drawer oh this is where I left it okay later on when I get home I'll pick it up Animals also do it. If you want afterwards, you can ask me about the little dog, by the way. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, some things we already spoke about, of course, you know, elimination of the fear of death, assistance to others. This is a very big thing. I wish we had the entire month to talk about, you know, how can we help people while we are outside the body. Identification of our personal existential program or life task, increase of paranormal abilities, not just the OBE, but, you know, clairaudience, clairvoyance, intuition, precognition, past life recall or retrocognition. We actually have a book that talks, you know, about that specifically. Access to other dimensions. I also wish I had an entire month <laughs> to tell you about everything that you can see outside the body. But you basically become like an explorer of the spiritual planes. I don't know if this is going to make sense, but sometimes one of the things that I say is one of the most spiritual things that people can do is learn to know directly or to access directly the spiritual planes. Because I'm sure that most of you already have a lot of information and have already read a lot and are very versed on, you know, on, even on different philosophies and schools of thought. So now the out of body experience helps us to put practice with the theory. And then, you know, this is, where, this, is, this is where the access to other dimensions comes in. Greater spiritual maturity or spiritual development, and along those lines, you know, an understanding of an ethics that is greater than just simply the ethics that we practice here in the physical reality. I would also need an entire month just to explain this. But afterwards, in the questions, you know, if this interests you, by all means, ask me, and I can give you there, a, you know, a, a three-minute summary. Okay? So uh, before I open it up for other questions, I have a few more questions for you. And let's, uh, going off of mention of Tom Campbell, as I'm sure you know, he helped build the Monroe Institute and has a whole theory about uh, the nature of reality. Uh, I'm wondering if you are, have anything to say about the Monroe Institute, what they do, Campbell, any of that. Do you have any opinions to share? I think that, the, that you know, which is a little bit similar to our work. I think that the, the more people that can learn to develop the out-of-body experience, the better, for sure. I know that the hemi sink, you know, they themselves, they mention how it works only to a certain, for a certain percentage of individuals. But I would say at the same time that that is true of any technique, which is what I was mentioning before, you know. I at least haven't seen one technique that works for everybody 100% of the times. So... You know, uh, that, is, that is one one aspect of it. The more 
people can learn about different techniques and find their own technique, the one that is going to work with their personality, with their predispositions and characteristics, the better. So the the one of the hemisync of the Monroe Institute is you know is one. One of the things maybe I would mention now now that you're asking me even about this is the idea of uh, trying as much as possible not to become too dependent of the machine doing it for you. Because these are the things that outside the body make all the difference. If we get used to something else doing it for us, once we leave the body, our will is not as strong. And outside the body, our will is everything. We are what we want, what we desire. And I say this because even in, in simple exercises like the one we did today of the Vilo, I have seen students that they start to practice it. They start to develop. They start to develop their will, and, they re and you realize that it requires a little bit of attention, of concentration. At first, you feel a little bit. Little by little, you feel more. <laughs> and little by little, you start to feel more. So this is great. But it requires for you to develop a lot, you know, your concentration, your focus, not to allow other ideas to come into your mind and everything. And I have seen many students, and they themselves, they have mentioned this, that after they try for a little bit, you know, uh, with different uh, machines and gadgets, sometimes they had the, ne the negative effect that afterwards when they would start to do the Vilo, they wouldn't have as much, you know, um, of their will, of their own motivation, of their own impetus, because they had gotten used to the fact that, you know, I'm just going to relax and let this other thing do it for me. So it's just a matter of being aware of that and, and being a little careful of that. Well, it's all, Campbell said he talks about hemisync as training wheels yeah, and says that, you know, get rid of them as soon, uh, as, you soon as you can. And he even said that the last time he tried hemisync, it felt like an anchor holding him down and he had to shut it off. Yeah. So he's in he, agreement. He, 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 and you know, along those lines, Monroe himself, he rarely used the hemisync. Yeah. His, his technique, which is interesting, his technique for having out-of-body experience was precisely inducing these vibrations that I was telling you so as to then leave the body. So, um, yeah, <laughs> along the same lines. Sorry? Yes, yeah. there is a vibration usually in the moment of the disconnection. So this technique that I was giving you of the velo, of moving the energies up and down, induces those vibrations. And then from here, the, the, if the vibrations reach a strong enough point, this induces the out-of-body experience. Yeah. And this was basically Monroe's technique to induce the vibrations so as to then disconnect from the body. Yeah. So uh, nothing, nothing wrong with the hemisync, just to be aware yeah. you know, of, that, of that detail. Uh, before uh, we do general questions, I have one more for you. Along these lines, uh, there are many groups of people doing out of body and teaching it and so on. Um, some of our members, thanks to Norma, have stumbled upon the phase and there's a, a PDF booklet that's gone around and it's helped a number of people go out. Um, and he had, his difference from everybody else is everybody else who's teaching um, techniques usually has to do with before you go to sleep, trying to relax while you focus, body asleep, mind awake, that kind of thing. And his approach is don't do any of that go to sleep, but work on becoming aware when you wake up. Uh, do you have anything? You're, I think you're aware of his stuff. Yeah, Ma Michael anything? Raduga, right? I think is yeah. his name. But, but, um, but yeah, no, we, we have techniques like that. We, we usually even tell people, you know, certainly try it when you go to bed, but sometimes it works better once you have already rested mm -hmm. for some hours in the night or even the entire night because uh, the brain is sharper, the concentration, the focus, everything will be, will be easier. So I think that that's you know, something that can help. Okay. Um, yeah, wake you know, even something that can help a lot, a very interesting routine is you know, to sleep the entire night, then you wake up and maybe go for a little walk, and then you come back and you relax and you try to do the out-of-body experience. I think that would be the best routine. It's just that I know that normally most of us, we don't have, you know, a couple of hours in the morning to just uh, stroll around. But really, that uh, can help quite a bit. Yeah. Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll bring the mic over to you. Otherwise, you won't be heard on the video, and we want to hear your question. Oh, okay. oh you're holding it. Yeah. 
Go ahead, Raymond. What is the connection between out-of-body experience and remote viewing? Would you say one of them is advancement of a remote viewing or like, well, like a next step or something? Uh, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, the remote viewing, like I was mentioning before, is more the displacement of your sight, you know, your, your vision. You can, um, uh, when you're outside the body, your vision is not based on light. So what I mean to say is if I look in this direction, my vision is going to stop at the, at the wall because there is an object that doesn't allow the light to go through. If this window, you know, was clear, then yes, I could see for miles because the light can go through. But outside the body, it's not based on, you know, the light that objects are reflecting or that objects are not reflecting. But it's, the vision is almost like a telescope, and you choose with your will how far away you focus the telescope. So I can focus on something that is very close, or I can focus on something that is very far. And this is basically remote viewing. You know, you can focus on something very far and, you know, see it and everything, but you're still here. This is outside the body. But you can do it inside the body, of course, no, no doubt. Uh, but I was asking, um, doing um, remote viewing defined as doing it fully aware, not out of body. There is some people who practice, yeah. you know, remote viewing like in the classroom kind of set setup, you know. And right. would you, how would you compare this to going out of body? That's my question. Okay. Yeah, indeed, you can do it inside the body. And, well, they are different just because in one you are displacing your sight and in the other one you're going with your entire being, you know, to do different things, I guess. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the difference. In one is just your sense that is going, and in the other one is you, yourself, your center of the memories, all of your experiences that is going. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. How often do you do you practice OE? Practice, I would say, maybe five times a week, How or so. Many times that do you does do you does it happen? Five times a week? I would say about half. Wow. Okay. Usually, it depends on the phase of the life, and I say this because this happens to students as well. If we are very focused on something physical, you know, we just started a new job, um, we just moved to a new city, usually the amount of your out-of-body experiences is less. But if you have a period in which you are settled with your routine and you know how things are going to go, then it becomes a lot, more, a lot easier. Something else I think that, it, that is going to be interesting. In the classes we mentioned this, the hardest out-of-body experience of the night is the first one. After you had one that night, having a second one that night is easier. And having a third one that night is easier than the second one. What you need to do in order to keep that chain going is that you need to keep your, your same emotional, energetic control. Meaning if you come back from the first out-of-party experience, you grab maybe your pen and paper, and you start writing down, okay, I did this, I did that, ta 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 okay. Let me prepare myself for a second one, it's going to be much easier. But if, on the other hand, let's say you come back from the first one and you start celebrating, you know, you start jumping on the bed, yes, yes, I had an out-of-body experience, you won't have a second one. You change completely your energetic condition, you know, your emotional condition. It's just simply going to be harder. So some, sometimes there is a night in which you have three, four, but then you go a week without any, for example. Yeah. No, I tried. I tried to do it about five times. Uh, I, I should say I tried to do it every night. But like any normal human being, sometimes I put my head in the pillow and I am gone. <laughs> I am just seeing pitch black. You know, so at least one or two nights a week, you know, are lost because of that. Because of the... We can't hear your question. <laughs> Do we not all leave our bodies every night when we go to sleep, yes. conscious of it or not conscious? Yes, but then here I was making a distinction between the conscious and the unconsciousness. So yes, we all disconnect, but I, or maybe I misunderstood your question. What I was answering is I try every night to leave the body with awareness. And then many times I don't even get to the exercise. The moment I put my head on the pillow, I'm gone. Of course, on those nights I disconnect, but I am unaware, and in the morning there is no recollection, there was no perception, basically. Yeah. 
Two-part question here. Um, let's say, and, and the following questions are based on your personal experience from doing this and training people for many, many years. Okay, your personal experience. Um, so if you went to the beach right off the boardwalk down here and you pulled 100 people who were true volunteers out of the group and, and A, you let them apply the the Monroe, the hemi, hemi sink approach versus the breathing approach, like you just talked about. Would you say maybe 20% would get success from either one or what? I don't know. I, 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 am, I wouldn't be able to tell about the hemi sink at all. Uh, I don't know how long it takes. I don't, uh, if I remember correctly, I think they themselves say that it was 15% of the population that had success with that, but I don't know how long it takes, you know. How about uh, breathing? Generally speaking, you know, leaving the body and having the first OBE, I would say takes about, with control, you know, um, I would say takes about six, six to eight weeks, more or less, hmm. Hmm. on average. I've had students that have it the first day, the first week, but I don't want to give you the impression that this is the normal, that this is what everybody does, yeah? So, okay. Second part is my brother died. He was drunk and he fell in a swimming pool and he was basically underwater for a while and they pulled him out and they had to resuscitate him. And he, he was probably not breathing for four or five minutes, something so, like so that. So a near death experience. So he had a near death. But again, you always hear the stories of people who had the tunnel, the light, everything else. He says he just remembers a dream, just like he was dreaming every night. He didn't see a tunnel. He didn't see a light, anything. So your personal experience, again, d d it's like half the population maybe not experience anything? You know, I wouldn't be able to tell uh, because how many people, you know, lose consciousness in the middle of a surgery or go through accidents and what percentage of those really have a near-death experience where they are aware, is some, it's a study that is missing. I, I don't know if anybody knows. Uh, what you do know is that there are a lot of accounts of near-death experiences, but I mean millions of accounts of near-death experience. But I don't know how many other millions they maybe just saw a dream or they saw pitch black. So it, that, that would be something very hard to, to tell. And certainly I don't have the experience. You know, I, I've never had a near-death experience. I, I hope none of you, <laughs> you know, how to go through a near-death experience also. So, but um, I, I wouldn't know what the numbers would be. Yeah. I have a question. Um, is, would it help if you took more melatonin or more supplements? Is there anything you could do to open up the pineal gland more, <laughs> without using DMT or ayahuasca? That's more, right. Just naturally. Yeah, tr try not to. And, and I would say even melatonin and the other ones that we have seen, they don't necessarily increase the probability of having out-of-party experiences. But it's interesting that you mentioned the pineal gland because there is a technique. I don't know if it's in my book, but for sure we explain it in the classes. It is in my book, right? The pineal gland technique. There is a technique that we, that we talk about and that is on the book that is the pineal gland technique that there are certain exercises that you do with your, with your face, with your eyes, so as to activate the pineal gland. And, and you don't necessarily need to ingest anything, you know, that, because sometimes when you take melatonin, depending on how and when, um, it can, you know, alter your biological clock, the, the way your body works. So um, I wouldn't recommend it, even for out-of-body experiences, no. But I would rather do these exercises. This technique of the pineal gland is interesting. I don't know how many of the students maybe have tried it, but this is the type of technique. There are some techniques where you leave the body gradually. You feel that you're disconnecting, 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 and you go out. Great, but it takes maybe 10, 20 minutes for the process to happen. There are other techniques that sometimes three days have gone by, you have been trying it, nothing has happened. All of a sudden, usually with sounds around your ears, and probably several of you might have heard these sounds like a, like a buzzing, like a zzz, or like a crack, crack, crack. You know, you just pop outside the body, whoosh, and you're out. The pineal gland technique produces this more sudden disconnection. This is a, an interesting technique. Thank you. 
And she mentioned ayahuasca. And what, what is your opinion about the various drugs that some people Don't take? use them. Don't use them at all. Yeah. You don't need them also. I recently had an uh, out-of-body experience. I, was, I have a bad back, so I lie on the floor a lot, have a mat. Yeah. And I remember sitting up, looking around my room and thinking, man, I really need to clean this room. And then I look, I look back and I saw myself sleeping. I was thinking, how could I, how can I see if my eyes are closed? I saw my physical body touch my eyes to make sure they were closed, and they were. And when I turned, turned around, I saw my granddaughter come into the room, and she, you know, she yelled, Nana, that's what she calls me, my great-granddaughter. Yeah. And at that instant, I felt, I jerked like I was falling. And I looked at her, and she was like looking over me, so I, I know I saw her come in the room. But it was confusing because I thought when you had an out of body, you didn't have any connection with your physical body. But I actually felt myself filling my eyes, make sure they were closed, yeah. and I actually saw myself doing that. So that confused me for a while. I didn't understand how I could actually have the conscious mind and then the physical mind working at the same time. Yeah, you know, when, when we are close to the physical body, we actually can have this that is called of, you know, uh, double, double perceptions where you can feel with both bodies. Let me see if I can, since I keep referring to this, this is already from the classes, but uh, uh, let's see. Come on. No. All right. Let me not be lazy. <laughs> Oops. So uh, when you are close to the physical body, you can perceive with both bodies. And um, this is the double perceptions. You can, you know, use the, um, and there are many common sensations of this connection. So this one that you're describing is this one down here, the double perceptions. And then you can be feeling with the physical body and also feeling with the astral body. But this usually happens when you're maybe like uh, five, 10 feet away from the physical body. Usually after that, you are just in your astral body. You only have the sensation of your physical body lying in bed, and you can be, you know, miles away. Yeah. Where it's I also. Was, I was. I was sitting up, so I was like, yeah. still in my body, I guess, half in and half out. But it just, when I actually woke up physically, I was thinking, wow, that's really weird because I felt myself touching my eyes, and I could see myself doing it at the same yeah. time. So that was. Yeah. That was kind of. Yeah. Those Weird. are the double perceptions, exactly. I, since you were talking about sound, <clears throat> tonal frequencies, do we all have different tonal frequencies based on karma, based on how we've lived our life? Um, also, intention and law of attraction. So if we raise our tonal frequency, do we attract more positive to us? Yeah. Or is there something we can do to... Because I've noticed the last two years, I really have been attacked, personally, right. financially, family. And I'm usually a very upbeat, spiritual type of person. And but, my thoughts are usually very positive and right. higher. Right. But it seems like I've been surrounded by a lot of lower, lower elementary energy lately, the last two years. Right. We, we all have a certain uh, quality to our energies, yes, depending on our thoughts, depending on our intention, depending on, you know, the way we lived our life, the things that you were saying, all of that, certainly. We have a certain quality of our energies. And by the way, this is a little bit related to, the, to what I was describing here of cosmoethics. You know, let me see if I can go back here. Uh, this is just all from the classes, sorry, but... The, it's just the order of the, of the images, all related to the idea of cosmoethics, you know, the degree of ethics that we have within us. Yeah? And this, this um, tune, you know, helps us to tune in to certain dimensions and repels us from other dimensions, so to speak. What I mean to say is sometimes, even because you're talking about attacks and things, sometimes people ask, look, can I leave the body and be attacked? Will I see, you know, an unsavory character or, you know, something like this? The answer is it is possible, but it's very unlikely. It is a lot easier to be attacked or to be mugged here in the physical dimension than outside the body. Outside the body is very rare. What, what happens is this, and, and, you know, to relate it to the other thing that you were asking. We have the tendency to tune in with people who have the similar level of ethics of us. 
when you are outside the body. Inside the body, we are all at the same level. I mean, good people and bad people are at the same level. But let me see if I can give you a very quick explanation of this. Look, think about the following. All of us, we have a certain idea of what is right and wrong inside of us, right? And we have it, and we live by it. And we, obviously, everybody thinks that they are doing the best they can, you know, with, with this. And this is, this is okay. But I guess what I'm trying to show you is when we compare what we consider to be right and wrong with our parents, we realize that there are small differences. They have slightly different ideas of what is right and wrong. And when we compare this with our kids, there are also differences. You know, they have different ideas of what is right and wrong. And you know human nature, right? Each one of us wants to think, I am right. My father, no. My son, no. But of course, they're thinking the same thing. They're thinking, I am right. My father, no. My grandfather, less. But the grandfather is thinking exactly the same thing. I am right. My son, more or less. My grandson, ah, come on. Pull up those pants, first of all. You know, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> I would tell them the same thing, you know, to pull up the pants first of all. But anyways, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to show you here is what are these differences telling us? Why are there these differences? And first of all, the human nature is to think that we are all absolutely correct, which eventually we realize, of course not. But uh, the second thing is that these differences are showing us that what we consider to be right or wrong naturally is very influenced by this life by the decade we grew up in, by the country we grew up in, by the culture we were raised. And what is interesting is that when you leave the body and, for example, you meet spirit guides and consciousness like this, you realize that they are not influenced by one country or one language or the Western Hemisphere or one planet, but their ethical criteria are a lot more universal, more cosmic. And this is where the word cosmoethics comes in. But each one of us has a degree of cosmoethics that is greater or, you know, lesser. So the reason why we don't bump into unsavory characters is the following. Think about a common thief, okay? I know that we can think of people that are much worse than just simply a thief. I, I know you can, I know I can, but we don't need to go there, okay? <laughs> just think about a common thief. Think about the fact that this person thinks, the way they think and the way they live their life is, in order for me to get ahead, I need to steal things from other people. Now think about it. This might sound a little abstract to you, but it's not. This is what defines you. How many times have you had this idea that the common thief has in your life? I probably think that none of you has ever had this idea. This is what differentiates you so much from the dimension of common thieves outside the body. This is why it's so hard outside the body to find them to bump into them. Do you understand what I mean? But inside the body, everybody's at the same level. The real danger is really inside the body. Outside the body, the things is a lot simpler, a lot easier. You know, when I moved to Los Angeles, I give this example, that my car was broken into three times in the first year. And in good places, by the way. One time was here in Santa Monica, the other time was in Westwood, and then in the area of Los Feliz. You know, so it's, they're good areas. And I, and I give that example because um, that type of invasion of my things or invasion of my privacy outside the body never happened to me, ever, ever. But inside the body, it's a little bit more common. Yeah. Now, what I would say is, you know, generally speaking, I know that we are, you know, uh, or uh, we are good people trying to do the best we can and everything. But somewhere, somehow, and this only you can, can tell, you came into contact or you went into something that didn't have the most ethical of energies. And then you connected to that and they, you opened a little bit the door to some of these things. You know some things that sometimes can create this, and I'm not saying that necessarily is your case, but I'm saying this so that hopefully all of us, maybe we can be a little bit vaccinated against this. Sometimes the drug environments the drug environments. The person wants to leave the body and goes, goes to do ayahuasca or things like that. Sometimes those environments that are a little bit more underground can, can open the door a little bit and the person starts to receive a lot of energetic counterflow and attack from that. I'm not saying that necessarily it's gonna happen, but I'm saying these types of things that are a little bit more underground and subcultures, they can produce some things like that. 
But just to give you some ideas, I honestly don't know what is it that, you know, that came in contact with you, right? But the most constructive, the most constructive and the most productive thing, this exercise that I was giving of the Vilo, you also do it for energetic self-defense. If you become very good at it, you're going to see that you repel these energetic attacks. So, so exercise it, okay? okay yeah. And the, no, we're, no? We're, we oh. just have one more, and then we're okay. going gonna to do uh, one last thing after this, though. Uh, and you need to hold your mic up a little closer. Oh, okay. Uh, last question. Um, so when you mentioned uh, everyone goes out of body uh, on a nightly basis, uh, what is it that is actually out of body if, if you're not aware and awareness is a, is a part of your consciousness? Um, would you say that it's kind of like closing your eyes and walking around, uh, just you're shutting off a part of that, your, your senses? Because uh, if, if you're not conscious, then what is out of body yeah, no, you're, at you're, that time? Yeah, you're right. Uh, what, what is leaving the body is the astral body. The astral body is the one that is disconnecting. But unfortunately, as you are pointing out correctly, the person is unaware. So it's almost as if the person is... I don't know if to say choosing, but let me use the word choosing for now. It's choosing to be outside their body with their eyes closed. In this case, it's not that he's choosing, it's just that it's the conditioning, the conditioning of the entire life, really, that is making the person think that, you know, the moment that the physical body is offline, I should be offline. This is, you know, more than anything, the biggest thing. Yeah, but it's the astral body, the one that disconnects. Okay. Uh, let us thank Luis Minero for our thank great you. presentation.